Okay. Okay. Um, so welcome everybody um, to our presentation. Um, I hope you don't have that much of a hangover. Um, right. So uh, we're talking today about uh, Rosync IoT, and we took a specific look on the Xiaomi ecosystem. And our aim is uh, to gain cloud independence and to add some additional functionality by firmware modifications. Um, so our outline for today is that I'll give you a very short introduction to the um, um, how we start at Quicks, for example, and then we continue with the Xiaomi Cloud, how it works more or less, and uh, then we go directly over to the devices and how you can uh, uh, route uh, specific devices. Um, one uh, warning, um, we are probably very tired and I have still jet lag, so I expect not too much from our speech, so our <laughs> skills are not that good. Uh, all right, so let's start with the introduction. Um, well, the first question could be why Xiaomi, actually? And the thing is, so they claim like in 2017 that they have like 50 million connected devices. Nowadays, it's, I think it's way more. And uh, they um, got m like nearly 2 billion euros in um, uh, revenue in 2016, so they're not that smart company. And the other thing is, most of the stuff is super cheap, so it's like the best reason to, to start with IoT. Um, to give you some impression about the cost, uh, so you can get a vacuum cleaner with LiDAR for more or less 260 euros. The Generation 2, which can do some mapping, is also like um, costing 400 euros. Um, the smart gateway is very cheap, the sensors are very cheap, and you can get uh, Wi-Fi connected light bulbs for between 6 and 12 euros. Um, everything more or less from China, so, well, uh, including shipment, by the way. Um, right, so some news about Xiaomi. So actually we had some deal with Facebook that they uh, produced the uh, Oculus Rift, so um, very successful with that. And apparently I heard some rumors that they have some lawsuit problems with Segway, so they found the typical solution to simply buy the company and the lawsuit was over, so they have quite a lot of money for, to do that. Right, so how we started. So in May 2017, um, we first started with the uh, vacuum cleaning robot, Generation 1, and the Mi Band. Um, then we continued to the smart home gateway and the sensors. Um, in July, uh, we had a look at the, uh, at the light bulbs and the LED stripes, because, well, we wanted to have some light. <laughs> And we continued in October van with the desk clamps because they are also quite useful. Um, in December, we took a look at the ceiling lights and the Philips smart light bulb. And at, um, now in the beginning of the year 2018, we took a look at the Generation 2 uh, vacuum cleaner and some bedside lamp. Um, so we took a bright look over all their um, like products. The only thing that we didn't buy were like uh, things like electro scooters or something because it's very difficult to get them to Europe and they're also expensive and well. Um, so we got all the stuff that is quite useful for us also. Next question is why we started with vacuum cleaners and um, the thing is I saw in the beginning of 2017 a very nice advertisement by uh, Xiaomi which uh, claimed that they have uh, in their vacuum cleaner three processors. Um, one of them is a, is a quad core, so, well, it's the perfect thing to, to get very powerful hardware, so why, why not take, take a look at that? And this was more or less how we, how we started. So, next thing is, um, let's take a quick look at the Xiaomi cloud. And um, one important thing is um, that actually not everything which is uh, having the Xiaomi label on it is actually produced by Xiaomi. So there are different vendors uh, which use the one ecosystem. Um, the good thing about that is um, they use the same protocol for their communication, um, but they also use like different technologies like Zigbee, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth. Um, right. So one interesting thing is we have um, more or less public guidelines for their implementations. Um, like how they expect to, to um, the cloud protocol uh, to work. Um, but the correct implementation, like in the, in the final product, it depends more or less on the, on the vendor. <laughs> right. Um, so here's more or less like a very simple overview about their um, products. What you see here is that um, you have different uh, technologies to communicate, for example, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth LE, or Zigbee. And in the initial setup, the, um, the central point of your ecosystem is uh, the 
uh, your smartphone with the um, Xiaomi app. And after you set up more or less the devices, the devices themselves connect directly to the cloud. So basically, the, the smartphone uh, doesn't have any to do anymore with the cloud connections of the like, Wi-Fi enabled devices. Um, and the next thing I would like to take a look specifically at the um, cloud communication directly between the devices and the Xiaomi server. And um, so to, to, to make it possible to have a communication where have specific configurations on the devices. So for example, um, every device has a unique uh, device ID, which is also never changed. And we have um, two kinds of keys. The one key, the cloud key, um, it's a 16-byte uh, long alphanumeric key, which is used for the AES encryption. And it's only used for the, for the cloud communication. Um, about this key, which is important, is that it's uh, burned more or less into the devices. So for the, for the um, like, uh, embedded systems, it's burned in the uh, one-time programmable memory. For the other systems, like for the vacuum cleaner, it's like a file. But it's never changed in the update or like provisioning. The second key is the token, um, which is also used for, for like the encryption, but it's more or less for the communication between the app and the device. For example, if you want to control your robot uh, from your local network in terms of like driving around with that, then we're using like the, the token for that. Um, the weird thing about that is that it's dynamic. So every time you, if you provision the device um, newly, then the, the token is regenerated. So you cannot like to get once the token and have it forever. If, if you connect it to a new Wi-Fi, if you can configure that, then the token is gone and uh, there's a new token. Right. Um, so um, about the cloud, cloud protocol, we are two more or less um, ways to connect to the cloud. It's UDP and TCP, but the payload is more or less the same. And the encryption key depending on the usage. For example, if the cloud is um, connecting to the device, uh, then the cloud key is used if the app is um, connecting uh, to the device when the app key is used or the token. Um, so this is like how the um, packet looks like. So what you have here is um, you have the, the length of the packet um, and the device ID, which is in the header. And they use also like the uh, Unix time for uh, time synchronization and also to make sure that it's fresh. Um, so one thing what we do very, very good is actually we check the length. So you, we try to really like to, you know, send bigger packets, to send shorter packets. Uh, if the length is not OK, we just, just throw it away. Um, then you have also data field, which is um, having the um, encrypted messages. Um, this, this thing is encrypted with AES in CBC mode. Um, and like I said, you use different keys. And the other thing is you have also like a checksum field where the key or the token is like uh, counting into you. So you just cannot like, you know, manipulate the packet in terms of uh, checksum if you don't know the keys. So this is not that bad. I mean, we saw way worse of things, so, or at least something. Um, about the protocol itself, usually it's uh, just JSON formatted uh, messages. Every packet has some packet ID, so um, you cannot really replay packets. Um, the structure is more or less that you have commands, which is the method and the parameter, and responses, which is just saying like uh, results and giving you like the JSON formatted string. Um, usually, every command is um, confirmed by the receiver, so um, you get like also um, confirmation by the by this device. Um, here in the bottom, I have an example for that. This is the OTC info method, which is usually sent every time if the device is trying to connect to the um, to the cloud. And the device tells the cloud, oh, I can, I'm connected to this Wi-Fi. The uh, SSID of the, uh, the, sorry, the MAC address of the Wi-Fi is this and this. And uh, the internal IP addresses are that. So technically, the cloud knows exactly to which uh, SSID it's, it's connected, uh, the device is connected, and what the MAC address of the, of the um, Wi-Fi router is. Um, so. Let's take another look, um, a very short look, um, to the HTTPS interface between the app and the cloud. And one thing we noticed there is um, that we do the authentication over OAuth, and we're using layered encryption. So basic, basically, you have outside the HTTPS, which is protected with the certificates, um, and inside you have some um, RC4 or AES encryption, um, which more or less depends on, on the app. So the app can say, like, oh, well, I use Etsy 4 and um, um, they have also like a distinct like session key for that communication. 
Um, they do also like some integrity um, protection for the message, so it's like not very, very easy to to like manipulate that. And the message format is also like JSON RPC. Um, we have here an example for that. Um, so here you see some communication between the app, which is um, asking um, to get a device list for the user, and to get here um, the response from the cloud, which is saying like, oh, to this user, uh, this and this list, uh, device is belonging to. So you get a list here. Um, one thing you might notice is this thing. So you get some coordinates for that, which might be a little bit strange because your cloud tells you some coordinates of something. And um, so when we did the research, we actually uh, looked to be like very um, anonymous in terms of we have multiple phones so to make sure that Xiaomi doesn't know where the devices are. And so they don't, can, uh, can't block like all our devices if we uh, fool around with the cloud. Well, what we figured out actually is that the cloud exactly knows where the devices are actually. So, um, in the beginning of the provisioning process of the device, um, you need to give the app the permission to um, get the location that it can find the Wi-Fi access point of the device. And then it uh, tells the cloud, oh, by the way, this device was provisioned here. And so Xiaomi knows all the time, more or less, where the devices are. Not very nice of them, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> but just you know, so that you know. Right, so let's start to um, take a look at their products. Um, Right, so for their products, they use uh, different architectures, um, which is um, um, sometimes nice and sometimes not very nice if you do reverse engineering. Um, so for their high power products, like the vacuum cleaners, they use Cortex-A processors. Um, for like smart home devices, they use like, um, like gateway slide pops, they use Cortex-M processors, and they are more or less two favors. Um, one, um, they use the Marvel chip, which is a chip with integrated Wi-Fi. And um, sometimes we use also like the MediaTek chip, which is like having Wi-Fi and Bluetooth LE. There are also other products like routers or cameras for your MIPS. And the most horrible thing, if you ever do reverse engineering, it's Extensor, which is also called uh, also known as ESP8266, ESP32. So if you ever saw like a binary from that, it's like well, don't waste your time. I mean, if you try to open either, I, either have no idea about the process architecture. There's some community model for uh, um, plugin for that, but it's just don't waste your time. It's way easier to just rewrite the software than to try to reverse engineer it. Right. Um, operation system wise, um, sometimes we use like a complete um, operation system like Ubuntu. This is the case for the vacuum cleanings at cleaning robots. Um, sometimes we also use embedded Linux. This is the case for like um, IP cameras or routers. And for like the small devices, we use more or less um, RTUS. So for their uh, light bulbs, for their like um, smart home gateways. Um, right. So I have here some selection of devices. The, these are the devices which I could safely bring from US here without getting you know problems with the TSA. The vacuum cleaner was a little bit too big for that, so I'm sorry about that. Right. Um, as I mentioned before, there are different implementations of products, and some are good and some are maybe not that good. So here um, we have uh, the implementations of three different vendors, uh, three different manufacturers. Um, for example, if you, see, uh, if you take a look at uh, Rock Robo, which is the producer of the, of the vacuum cleaner, they're using like this very um, powerful Alvinner processor with um, an SDM and also a Texas instrument chip. The firmware update is encrypted and is downloaded by HTTPS, and the certificate is also checked. And all the debug interfaces are somehow protected. So, for example, you cannot just connect to Siri and log into the, the uh, into the vacuum cleaner. They have the uh, they have a specific root password for all of the that stuff. In comparison to the gateway, um, which is produced by Lumi, uh, Lumi United, um, they're using like the, the Marvel chip, which, is ha which has a Wi-Fi, and the firmware update is completely unencrypted and we downloaded it over HTTPS. So bonus thing is we also don't check the MD5, so basically you can just send anything to that if it has a specific format. Um, good thing is all debug interfaces are available, so you can just connect to JTAG and everything is fine. Um, for the Philips ceiling light, it's produced by um, Yealing, which is actually doing all their lightning products, uh, like from, like, which is sold by Xiaomi. By using the MediaTek chip here, and uh, the firmware is also not encrypted. Fun thing is, we're using HTTPS, 
but they don't check the certificate. So basically, it's well, you can also exchange that. And he, also here are some um, debug interfaces available. Um, there are two fun facts, but I, but I, which I don't have on the slides, but I can tell you here because we are, you know, good friends. Um, one thing is, um, so the ceiling light has a complete um, root CA thing with TLS and everything, so usually we could check for certificates. And the second thing is the smart home gateway have some, I don't know, I, I don't, I don't know if, it, if, if you can call it backdoor, but the smart home gateway is usually a Chinese-only product, which you just have in Chinese, uh, in China, and which is not sold anywhere else, but it has a specific mode where it sends a lot of data to a server in Salt Lake City in the US. So if you Google like the server, you find nothing, and the server is not giving very much information. So this was just one thing which is maybe weird about the implementation. Right. So let's get access to the devices. Um, first, we start with the vacuum cleaning robots. So um, we have two generations of the vacuum cleaners, but they technically, like, from the internals, more or less the same. So basically, it doesn't matter if you have a generation one vacuum cleaner or generation two vacuum cleaner. Um, we start here with the generation one vacuum cleaner. So um, what you see here is you have a lot of like, um, interesting sensors in this device. Uh, so you have the complete uh, like LiDAR sensor, which is very unusual for a product which you can buy for like 250 euros. Um, you have electronic compass, clip sensors, like, um, which make sure that it doesn't fall off like, the, the stairs. And you have like, a gyroscope and accelerometer. So stuff which is usually found like, in your smartphone, but you wouldn't expect it in a vacuum cleaner. So this makes it also a very nice platform. Right. Um, so for the root challenges, um, well, we wanted to get somehow access to, to the, to this, uh, to the uh, hardware, but we hadn't done any idea what is running on that. So, um, well, the, the first obvious thing you would uh, uh, try to, to look at uh, are like hardware-based access, and the second thing what you can do is like you can take a look at the network traffic and figure out if you can do anything with that. So what we did is, well, we saw that it has a USB port, which you can see here, um, the generation two has also the USB port, but you have to open a little bit more um, of the device. So we tried that, and we figured out it has some um, protected ADB running, which is you asking you for a lot of like uh, challenge response messages, usually with information that you don't have, like if you're not a vendor. The second thing is we look at the P PCB and try to figure out if there's some obvious like serial port. But the thing is, we were, you, you can't tell anything about the PCB in terms of like if it's a serial port or, or not. So we were also unsuccessful with that. Um, the technical next thing is like you do a port scan, try to find like um, um, open like ports, like Talnet, which is very widely used, like for cameras or something. But unfortunately, also all ports were closed. And uh, sniffing the network traffic, we are also unsuccessful because well, um, we're using encryption, obviously. Right. So the next step you usually usually do is like you tear this whole thing down and this is assemble in, in all parts. So this is like the photo of the generation one. Um, we will later publish also like generation two internal, so you can take a look at that. And um, so one thing we notice is it's very easy to to disassemble this whole thing. So um, what it did is uh, quite quite a lot of time uh, quite a time ago um, also like to tear down Niato vacuum cleaners or Vorwerk vacuum cleaners very horrible to, to, to open because it's like a lot of like clips parts and uh, the cable management is very messy. So if you open a vacuum cleaner from like Vorwerk, it's very hard to, you know, put it together again. And um, yeah, so don't do that. Um, this is a very nice example for us for devices which you can open like in five minutes without any problems and reassemble them in like three minutes and also without any problems. Right, um, so if you take a look at the front side um, layout of the, of the mainboard, we notice very, very quickly that there is some um, application processor, which is the R16 quad-core. Um, next to it, there's the 512 megabyte of RAM, and also like the four gigabyte of MMC flash. Um, over um, SDIO, there's also connected to Wi-Fi model, so like I said, the, the, the vacuum has Wi-Fi. And they use for all the read time sensor stuff, they use like an STM32, which takes care of all like the sensors, like the, um, except for the LiDAR, um, like the bump sensors or like the ultrasonic sensor. Um, there's a third MCU, which is in the LiDAR itself, which is not shown here. Um, so, like I said, this thing has like three different processors, uh, 
which is very nice for like a vacuum cleaner for 250 euros. Um, on the back side, you see that it has a lot of test points, um, which are just marked like test point one, test point two, test point three, and so on. And the, the, the fun thing about that was that the, but later we figure out where the UART test points for the, uh, for the application CPU were, and we were the only two test points which were not labeled, actually. So if you look for the serial, maybe look uh, not for the lab labeled pins. Um, well, how the layout of the um, Generation 2 um, vacuum cleaner looks like. Um, actually, we have the same like structure, like the application CPU. One thing we notice is that the whole PCB is coated in some sticky stuff, which is maybe not for like reverse engineering, like to, to protect against reverse engineering, but maybe protect against water or something. But it makes it very difficult to... Um, do anything like that, or even like looking to figure out what chips are um, like the model numbers or something. Um, but it's more or less the same. There's one difference. Um, usually, um, like the high class products of Xiaomi, um, you can very easily distinguish by uh, the black PCB. So they coat all the PCBs like with a black color, like uh, you see on a gateway. So this is like one of the first devices that I, show from Xiao uh, that I saw from Xiaomi, which have like a green PCB, which is way easier to uh, reverse than the black one where you, it's very hard to tr even trace the, the, um, the lines uh, to, to this device. So, well, we, now we want to try to root this thing and we are like multiple methods to do that. There's one, well, the typical way to do that is like uh, to retrieve at least the firmware is to do a very bad thing and this is on soldering like the MMC um, or the, like the SPI flash. But you see here that the, that the um, um, MMC is actually a BGA chip with a lot of pins which are mostly all used. So in, for most people who don't have any experience with resoldering that stuff, reboiling that um, chip, that means that you technically brick your device. Um, so it's very hard to, to resolder that again. And we found a simpler uh, solution for that, and the solution was actually to use um, aluminum foil. Um, now the question is, well, why you would do that, and what, how you do that? Well, if we take a quick look at the um, pin layout of the CPU, um, you notice that there are at the top there are like the MMC pins, and um, so we are more or less outside of the chip. And this is like the way we can abuse it very easily. So what we do technically is. Um, um, we try to shortcut the MMC data lines so that the SOC is not able to load a valid image from the MMC, and then it falls back to a specific mode where we can connect over USB and to send like t um, some programs uh, or to load some programs into the memory. And what we do next is like we load it like a tool which dumps all the MMC, so we can take a look at that and we can modify the image and we can rewrite it again very easily. Um, so here. To, to get some impression, what we do here is this is not a picture of the vacuum cleaner. This is one thing I found like on um, Creative Commons, uh, uh, Wiki Commons, sorry. And um, here you see there's a small at BGA chips. There's a small gap between the PCB and the chip itself. Um, so one thing um, which works is usually if you take one layer of aluminium foil and go under the chip, and then you can shortcut the pins. But the thing is, if you take two layers of aluminium foil, it's too thick, so you don't get under the chip. So one layer is just okay for that. Um, maybe a nice thing if you work with um, BGA chips. Right. So after we got the image, um, next step is we take a look at the software which we found there. And actually, I mean, the, the image was, of course, unencrypted. So um, we found there a complete Ubuntu 14.04 uh, with um, mostly untouched software, so we didn't do that much. Um, for the own navigation stuff and controlling of the vacuum, they use like an open source um, software which is called Player. Um, actually, it's not developed since I think a few years, but they somehow did it anyway. And uh, there's also like some proprietary software running on that device. They use some um, thing to, con uh, to connect to the cloud. They use like a, um, some internal um, tool to do like the all the robot control stuff, and they have their um, custom ADBD version, which is doing the authentication. One thing we noticed there, like the, um, they use IP tables to block off actually all the service, or to protect all the services, like uh, SSH and this player service, so you cannot access from outside. So 
SSH is running all the time, but you cannot access. Next thing um, we noticed, um, we took a look at that, uh, where the data, which are on the vacuum cleaner, and some of the data were like syslogs, um, or like durations of runs, and the, the area of um, the, like the cleaned area. But the other thing that we noticed were like in the log files, we are also like SSIDs and passwords, um, sometimes also like other credentials. And um, so this could be some problem. Next thing, uh, we noticed um, that in some of the binaries, we were, uh, in one of the binaries, there were some commands that you see here, TCP dump, like listen on uh, all interfaces and collect all the traffic. And this is one of the commands which can, can be uh, triggered from outside. So basically, Xiaomi can send like a command to your vacuum cleaner, and then it will happily uh, activate this command and um, collect all the data like from the um, Wi-Fi interface. Um, and of course, there's also the maps. So if you just have the vacuum cleaner somewhere standing around in your apartment, then it already will produce multiple megabytes of data per day. So um, it's not that they only upload the data if they clean your apartment, but they upload the data all the time. Um, one important thing is, if you do a factory reset, the data still is, uh, is still there. So let's say you buy a vacuum cleaner, you test it, you, find, uh, you figure out, okay, it's not suitable for you. And when you do the factory reset, the system is restored um, on the vacuum cleaner, but the data is still there. It's never deleted, actually. So the next owner of the vacuum cleaner can you know, grab the logs and figure out where the vacuum cleaner was, how the SSID name is, and uh, what the password for the Wi-Fi is. So maybe not the best idea to, you know, sell your vac use vacuum cleaners um, on eBay. Right, so if you take a look at the maps, um, so for generation one, it's, um, um, the maps are created by the player and they're uh, 1,024 times 1,024 pixels. And one pixel is more or less equivalent uh, five centimeters. The generation two, I think they are more precise than that. So you can actually, you can also set uh, the, the uh, position more or less of the, um, of the maps. Uh, so it's like on, onto you. Um, one interesting thing is you may see here, oops, you may see here some like um, diff different colors. So like the blue ones where, where, where the vacuum cleaner was ditching and the um, other like purple color where like moving people. So basically where like people standing in a lab and they're moving around and you more or less can see that something you know, was moving, which is well, I mean, also not a very good idea for privacy reasons. And here I have like a bigger map where um, the vacuum cleaner was starting in this room and he was going outside. Uh, until the end of the room and was running back, and this is like all he can, um, he could like uh, figure out. And the distance between here and the end is like 25 meters. So technically, we're quite good with the lidar sensor. And for like I said, for 20, uh, 250 euros, you get like a free lidar sensor. So even if you throw out, uh, throw away the vacuum cleaner, you have stored lidar sensor, which is very nice. Right. Um, Let's take a look at the communication relations. Um, so um, this is more or less like from the right, uh, the right side, the communication between the device and the cloud is more or less the same for all the devices. So um, in this example, the green box is um, representing the internals of the vacuum cleaner and the arrows show, more, uh, show the um, connection establishment from, um, from the, from the uh, components. So um, the most central component of the vacuum cleaner is the Mio client, which creates like a connection to the cloud. And all the internal com components um, are connecting to the Mio client. So the Mio client more or less works as some kind of like proxy or forwarder of the messages. Um, one thing to mention is that the, the outside communication is, like I said, encrypted, but internally all the, like, the blue color is like unencrypted. So there are multiple components. I reduced the, this thing a little bit. Um, but internally, we are speaking unencrypted JSON. So if you develop something for that, then it's, um, it's very easy to do that. So here's some example how it works. So basically, if the cloud sends a command to the, to the Mio client or to the vacuum cleaner, the Mio client will decrypt this command and will forward it to the internal component like app proxy. Um, the next thing the app proxy do is like forwarding the command uh, over IPC um, to the other components, which hopefully answer that. And then this whole thing is like going back to the cloud directly. 
So actually, like from the design perspective, not that bad. Um, going back to the internals of the MMC, so here is like some um, layout of the MMC, which is um, on the vacuum. One thing you might notice is that you have um, at least three copies of the operation system. So there's one fallback copy which is never touched, which is like the original copy of the, of the Ubuntu system which is delivered by the vacuum cleaner. And there are two copies of the operation system where one is active and the other one is passive. So if something goes wrong, then uh, it just reboots and boot, uh, boots the passive copy. So um, you cannot break that much of the vacuum cleaner. In the worst case, they just like restore the recovery to the other partitions. Um, one thing to mention here is that the, the storage for all the maps and logs is like the, the biggest partition here, so it's like nearly two gigabyte. Um, like I said, we collect a lot of data, so we need to, to have a lot of space to, to store your data. So, um, yeah, that's one fun thing. Right, um, so um, these are the partitions we need for the next step. We want to take a, the, uh, a look at the update process. And the update process is working that way. So we have on the left side, we have the app or the uh, server. And on the right side, we have the vacuum cleaner. Um, if the cloud wants to do an update on the device, then it sends a command called Mio um, OTR update. And uh, the cloud actually tells the vacuum cleaner where the update is located, um, so, so which web server has this update. And it also tells like uh, which MD5 checksum the, the vacuum cleaner will have. So basically, um, you, uh, I, this thing is like in, uh, transmitted encrypted. So more or less, they ensure like with the MD5 that um, the um, download later will be somehow protected by integrity. Right. So in the next step, um, we have our layout, uh, our MMC layout on the right side. And now the vacuum cleaner starts to download like the um, the firmware from the from the server. This firmware is encrypted, like I to uh, like I said. And the first thing that the vacuum cleaner do is actually, well, it, it checks the MD5 uh, sum of the of the packet if it's corresponding to the one from the update command. If it's okay, then the next step um, what it do is decrypt the image um, and unpack it to the download partition. So it's like an um, yeah so unpack it to the download partition, and uh, then it, the first thing that it will do is like update, update the root password in the etc shadow file in, in the firmware update. So basically, you cannot like, you know, set a password in the firmware and uh, push it on the vacuum cleaner, because the first, tip, uh, first thing that will happen is that if it just ch change the root password, every vacuum cleaner has its own root password. Right. Um, then the um, passive copy of the operation system is updated. The vacuum cleaner takes some time to rethinking and to reboot. And it boots then the passive copy. So you're running now already the a new operation system. If something goes wrong, like the operation system is corrupt or something, then you go back to the, to the like, old active partition. If it's OK, then you run um, like the update process again and update like the remaining partition. So in this few steps, you have like a complete updated system. Um, the thing which is not updated is, like I said, the re uh, recovery partition, so you can always go back to the recovery um, operation system. OK. Um, so what the firmware updates look like. So we are two kinds of uh, firmware updates, the full images and the partial images. We just stick here to the, to the full images. So we are encrypted uh, targz archives, and um, the full image um, contains of the full X4 file system um, of the vacuum cleaner of the of the of the operation system partition. They use um, encryption to protect that uh, firmware update, and they use Ccrypt, which is um, some standard Linux tool to you know uh, encrypt files of AES. And they have a very creative password for the, for the protection of the firmware, which is RockRobo, which is the name of the company. Um, and like I said, the integrity is protected by the MD5 checksum. Um, one interesting thing to mention is that they apparently put more effort in, in choosing the password for the sound files because it looks way more complicated. So um, what you can do is like, you can install like a sound package with transformers, speeches on the vacuum cleaner, so it speaks like a transformer. 
but we protected the image way better than the original um, firmware image. So how you can figure out um, like the, the the key for the encryption, and it was not that difficult actually, because so we we have you know we we don't know that you can remove all the debug symbols from the binaries. So basically, we compile everything with the debug symbols, and you just see that the password and the decryption command is very near together. So you just look at the strings and you know that already. Um, right. So now we know how the firmware is uh, encrypted. And now the, what we want to do is like we want to root it re uh, remotely. So um, the thing we can do is like we can and decrypt the, the firmware. We can um, do some changes and we can encrypt it again. So what we do is uh, we upload our authorization, uh, authorization key file into the firmware and also remove the IP tables rules to, um, to make like, SSH available from outside. The next thing we can do is like we can send the OTA command to the vacuum cleaner, which is just encrypted with the token, which we can easily get. And um, then just point the firmware update to our own HTTP server and everything is fine. Um, I have here some example for you. So you, you can connect to the vacuum cleaner in an unprovisioned state. You ask him very nicely to give you the token. He gives you the token, which is the standard behavior, actually. And in the next step, um, the vacuum cleaner will happily download like the encrypted package from your web server, which can be, like for example, on your laptop. And then the vacuum cleaner is ready. The thing what you can do is like you can access directly to the SSH, um, get the root shell. You can um, because it's on Ubuntu, you can install of course software. So you do apt get update and you can install any software you like, as long as you have space on the <laughs> on this disk. And um, uh, you can also like um, run your favorite tools like htop or something. Um, the one thing that you can do is uh, you can also access um, the sensors. So for example, this is some information from the LiDAR. And um, so you have a very powerful platform for, for, for very cheap, actually. Um, now the thing is, we, we told you that we would like to gain some independence from the cloud. So, well, how we do that? Um, if you bring all the things together, we have more or less two methods how we can do that. First thing is we can replace the cloud interface. And the second thing is we can proxy cloud communication. Um, this is more or less for all the devices. So this is um, just in this example for the vacuum cleaner, but we can do that more or less for all the devices. Um, so the replacement of the cloud interface is, is um, so that we replace the Miro client, which is the central component, and replace it with some own cloud client, which can be connected to your favorite home automation software, for example. And uh, the next step, we get rid of the um, upload and, and download capability of the um, app proxy, which is running like an internal component. So it cannot download any firmwares anymore, but it cannot uh, also push your maps like to outside. So now you're having control over your vacuum. Um, so this is a very radical way because you break the app functionality, so you cannot use any app anymore from Xiaomi. Um, less radical way is that you try to proxy the communication. And uh, for that, you need to extract the keys before. That. And this thing that you can do is you can redirect the communication to the cloud through your own like cloud server. Um, we published in December um, a, a open source implementation of the Xiaomi cloud, so you can run them locally and can like intercept all the communication. You can send own commands. You can um, suppress commands, for example, if you don't want to do firmware updates, and you can like reverse engineer like all the protocol. Um, and the good thing about that is you can also forward, it, uh, forward commands to the cloud. So basically, cloud still thinks that you're perfectly connected to the cloud, and the app will still work. So to summary, uh, summarize, the whole thing is we can root remotely. So um, we don't need you know, to have, uh, get any like, physical access to the device. Um, so we, you just have to do it once, like we did it for you. So you can do it um, like remotely. And you can run the, the cloud connection um, without like the real cloud, or you can con disconnect the cloud um, completely. Um, but one thing which is very important is um, our goal is always more or less to get uh, the cloud keys out of the device. So if we have the cloud encryption key, we can do anything with the, with the, with the um, vacuum cleaner because then we can send like update commands to, to the vacuum, and we can like send like any any stuff we want to the vacuum 
So the cloud key is the most important thing we want uh, to get. Well, so um, now the question is how it works with the other device, and then I want to give over to my colleague Daniel, who will present you all the other smart home devices which we have here. So, um, yeah, thank you. Okay, yeah, so now we, uh, we as we already saw, the, uh, we know how, now how to route vacuum cleaners, but we also get basically the, the other Xiaomi stuff also into our own cloud. So not, uh, do not use the, the Xiaomi cloud, but instead our own cloud. And uh, if we have a look into the ecosystem again, we will now have a closer look into the gateway and into the light bulb. So um, what does the hardware look like? So for uh, basically the light bulb, the gateway and LED strips, the application MCU is always the same. Um, it consists of an ARM Cortex M4. Um, it has 512 kilobytes of SRAM and it either has four megabyte or 16 megabytes of flash. And most importantly, there are uh, there is an 802.11 BGN Wi-Fi core, uh, which is also a nice thing, which uh, we will see later why. And um, additionally, the um, gateway also has a ZigBee MCU because, of course, it needs to connect all the other devices via uh, all, the, uh, all other sensors via ZigBee and then can, again, connect them via Wi-Fi to the cloud. Um, for the sensors, there are different sensors available. Um, they all use the same uh, NXP ZigBee chipset and for example, you have door sensors, a temperature sensor, you have uh, power plugs which you can control remotely, you have motion sensors, buttons which you can assign actions to, smoke detectors, uh, smart door locks, and so on. So lots of stuff. Um, so we basically, uh, what, we, what our goal was is to um, basically use the gateway in our own cloud and uh, as we already heard from Dennis, the most important thing is to get the cloud key. So what you can always do is tear the thing apart, as we did with the vacuum cleaner, and um, look at the, the PCB. And uh, we quickly saw that the PCB consists of uh, lots of test points, and uh, that SWD is enabled by default. So um, then we figured out what uh, we need to connect to these test pins and uh, we can already uh, dump the uh, cloud key from the device. But um, as you can guess, this <laughs> needs hardware access and is kind of a tedious process. Um, so for example, if we look in other hardware, like the, the light bulbs, this is even more tedious to uh, get access to the hardware. And we ask ourselves, uh, ourselves if we can access the cloud key without um, having access to the hardware itself. And we saw quickly that uh, the firmware updates are not signed. So um, we thought about how about we create a modified firmware update which gives you the key automatically. So um, this would be, it has the advantage that you don't need hardware ac access anymore, but uh, the operating system, the light bulb is uh, a bare metal operating system and you need to binary patch it. So um, our goals for the binary patching would, be, uh, would look something like this. So uh, on the right hand side you have uh, what the memory lo probably looks like. So you have some branch uh, on the original code, which then branches to some other code. And what we want to do is, um, is basically add our own code, and then we uh, also need to, to get to it somehow. When what we do is just um, override the uh, branch to the original code with an, another branch to our code. And then if we don't want to break the original functionality, of course, we need to branch back to the original code um, after our code is finished. So our goals can be summarized as follows. Um, we want to modify the program flow, we want to add additional code, and we also want uh, to use existing functions. So functions 
already in the firmware and we don't want to break anything. So why is binary patching hard in the first place? So uh, when we look at the ARM architecture, you can just say branch to this address. So there are no uh, absolute addresses. You always have to calculate them with your uh, value of the current uh, program counter and an offset. So it's kind of tedious to calculate uh, how a branch command need, uh, needs to look like. And uh, obviously, you don't want to write new code in assembly, which is also error prone and tedious, and uh, you need somehow a um, possibility to model your address space. So you need um, to have some space in the RAM where your code can be executed. You maybe want to use some functions in the ROM, and you also need uh, free space in the firmware to begin with to place your new code. And um, as, we, as I already said, we want to call existing functions, and uh, here, for example, uh, in the Xiaomi cloud, it is especially bad because you have ma uh, different devices and also different firmware versions. And you, you also want to be able to handle uh, these things without uh, much hassle. And for all this, we already uh, created a framework uh, together with Matthias Schulz, which, uh, uh, so he has the next talk and he will talk about this framework uh, in much more depth, but um, we created this uh, to basically patch, binary patch, uh, Wi-Fi firmwares from Broadcom, but now uh, here for our Xiaomi stuff, we adapted it to uh, our cloud devices. And um, so what follows is basically a very simple or very basic example of what uh, we need to adapt to make Nexmon um, uh, running on uh, for the smart devices of, of Xiaomi. And the first thing you need to um, edit is basically this, this definitions.mk, which is just an, um, a make file which uh, tells you where the RAM files, uh, where the RAM part is and where uh, you, you have space for the patching area. So if we take our previous um, image, we will see, okay, this is basically our original code, and this is where our new um, code goes. Of course, for this you need uh, to know uh, memory layout in advance, but um, yeah, someone uh, needs to at least once ha get a hardware access to, to the device and then uh, connect the debugger to it and basically dump the memory layout for you. So, but we already did this for you, so you're good to go. Um, the next thing is, because we want to uh, also use existing functions in the firmware, we need to somehow model them. And what we have here is basically the wrapper.c file. And um, here we, we uh, have a function which is called send over HTTP, which takes an, an string and sends the HTTP to some server. This is just a simplified uh, example. Don't take it too seriously. But most importantly, we have this uh, three add macros uh, which we use here to specify uh, on which chip this, uh, this function is and uh, what firmware version it is on and where in this firmware version it is located. So we can just um, basically define this function once but use it for all these three um, hardware and firmware versions. So what you need for this is basically somehow know uh, what functions are in the firmware, and uh, if you're unlucky, there are not many strings or uh, even debug symbols in the firmware, So, but uh, there's uh, also a trick for that. Um, so many... IoT um, ecosystems come with an, um, with an SDK. So what you can do is just download the SDK, uh, compile an example project, then um, load it into IDA, and use Bindiv to compare your uh, um, example project with your actual firmware. And then you can basically copy over the function names, and in the end you... Um, write them into the wrapper.c file to use them later on. So putting it all together, 
we have uh, a patch.c file, uh, which actually contains our new code. Uh, start so starting from the bottom to the top, um, we have a branch instruction. Um, this is basically what we saw in the beginning here. And um, this, so this basically overrides a an, an branch instruction uh, in the original firmware. Um, again, here we have some uh, macro which we uh, use to define uh, where this branch is located in the firmware, uh, on which chip is it is, and in which firmware version uh, we want to patch, basically. And just uh, don't worry for the uh, two parameters here. So it is just basically to uh, say, OK, um, on this location, I want now a branch and link command, which should point to this function, which we just defined over here. So um, as we said, we wanted to basically get to the firmware key. And this is all the function basically does, is uh, get a pointer to the key, then uh, uh, gen uh, generate an, an buffer, which um, contains the address of a web server, which is in our control, and then uh, sends the um, the key to this web server, basically. And uh, that's all it is. And also, if you don't want to break uh, any functionality, you would need to jump back to the original code. So the way you would do this is basically um, define the original function over in the wrapper.c file, and then just uh, call it in the end over here. So that's that's all we need, basically. And um, so uh, the next step is, now that we have patched our binary, we need to bring it in a format which we can use to uh, send it over the air. Um, there is some preliminary uh, work done by uh, Uri Sakret. And, but the problem is he just looked into the uh, SPI format. And this is actually different from the uh, over-the-air format. And, uh, but we al al already discovered how it looks like. And the good thing is you don't need to worry about it. Dennis wrote a script for that. And uh, he also uh, has the information for the MediaTek chips. So um, the next step is basically to send the modified firmware to the light bulb. So this can look something like this. We have the Xiaomi cloud on the one side and the light bulb to the, on the other side. And uh, so the first step would be that the bulb uh, connects to the Xiaomi cloud. The Xiaomi cloud says, oh, there's an update available. And then the default way would be, OK, um, then there is a second, basically, uh, server, uh, the Xiaomi CDN, which then uh, delivers the firmware back to the light bulb. But we don't want that. What we want instead is basically switch and uh, DNS uh, uh, switch or flip the switch uh, to um, connect to our own CDN, or so-called hillbilly CDN, um, which then the uh, light bulb connects to and gets our patched firmware. Here it is uh, important to mention that we currently cannot avoid the first step or we also cannot um, uh, start it manually. So we need to rely on that there is a new over-the-air update available on the Xiaomi cloud. OK. Uh, on, of course, um, now that we have uh, modified the firmware, we want to connect the light bulb to our own cloud implementation. So this would uh, look something like this. Um, it is basically similar to what we saw uh, in the for the vacuum. You just um, have your own dust cloud implementation, so you can, for example, either replace the uh, strings uh, for the uh, for the cloud connection in the firmware and uh, let it uh, point to your uh, dust cloud implementation, or you uh, just reconfigure DNS to point to your dust cloud implementation. So um, 
now that we are capable of patching arbitrary stuff in the firmware, we can also have a look what is uh, possible with this patching. So uh, the Marvel SDK comes with some sample apps. So one could imagine a peer-to-peer -peer implementation for light bulbs. Also, there's a frame injection demo. Uh, so you can maybe implement a T-authenticator uh, in your light bulb. And there's also a, even a sniffer demo. So there seems to be even a monitor mode. So uh, one final word of warning. Never leave your devices unprovisioned. Um, someone else can provision for you. So they can install malicious firmware or even snoop your apartment, as we saw. And uh, also be careful with devices uh, you buy secondhand. So for example, on Amazon Marketplace, they can contain malicious software. So um, that's basically it. We want to thank the CMO Mobile Networking Lab and the Crossing, which are both located at the uh, Technische Universität in Darmstadt. And we also want to thank Professor Nubier at Northeastern University. And everything we just say in all the software is uh, available at don'tvacuum.me and will be uploaded sometime after the recon talk. So that's it. Thank you for all your attention, and we will be happy to answer questions if there is time. Questions? I guess not. All right.